Hi everyone, and welcome to part 5 of the DMC2 training series. In the last episode, we looked at Fusion 360 and the general workflow for taking a 3D model and generating a facing toolpath for it. In this episode, we're going to look at more of the different toolpath options that Fusion 360 has, and how to set them up, as well as a few tricks and general things to watch out for. So picking up from where we left off in the last episode, I have this example part and I set up a 6mm facing operation on the top. I'm going to add a few more operations to this setup using the 6mm end mill to get more material removed with the tool before switching out to a smaller tool to get into the smaller features. So after the facing operations, I want to do a bore to clean out the material in this circular hole, so I'm going to click 2D and then bore, and it should already pre-select my 6mm end mill that I was previously using since it's all within the same setup. Looking quickly through the numbers here, 24,000 RPM for the spindle, 3000 mm per minute feed rate, looks good. On the geometry tab, I'm going to click selection, and then click the walls of the bore. In heights, everything here is fine. In passes, I am going to reduce the pitch from 1mm to something a little more shallow like 0.5mm to ramp down more gradually, and I'm going to turn on stock to leave, with a small 0.1mm radial stock. I'm doing this so that later on I can come back with a finishing tool and do a slower finishing pass. In linking, I'm going to leave everything as default, and then click OK. So this looks good, but from my experience I know there are going to be two catastrophic issues right here. If we click on the setup to highlight it, and then click simulate, let's see what happens. So the facing operation goes on fine, but then the bore operation plunges the end mill straight down into the stock to get to the bore. That would almost certainly stall the spindle and break the end mill. You can also see the little red line in the simulation, where it detected this and says rapid collision with stock. This is why you should always check the simulation before you run anything on your machine. So to fix this, I'm going to go back to the board to edit it, by double clicking, and then in the heights tab, I'm going to change the top height from the whole top to stock top, and then click OK. Now back in the simulation, everything looks fine, but there's still another problem that the simulation did not detect. If we scrub over to the end of the bore operation, there's this column of uncut material left in the middle, and the end mill plunges into this column when it finishes the bore to retract, which again is potentially catastrophic and could break the end mill. To fix this now, I'm going to go back into the bore operation, this time clicking on linking, and the problem is here in the lead in, lead out section. The lead in is fine because it doesn't hit anything, but the lead out is hitting. I could change all the leads to zero so that the end mill will directly go up and down, but I don't like that as a solution, because zero lead in and lead out tends to leave a little mark on the wall in that area where it retracted. And that also doesn't solve the issue of the column of material that shouldn't be there in the first place. So instead, I'm going to leave the lead in and lead out, and then go into the passes tab, and then I'm going to click multiple passes. This does a step over, which I can adjust the amount and width so I think the default 2 steps and 3mm step over should be fine. Let's check that in the simulation though. Now that bore finally looks good, no crashes and no sudden plunges into the material. Moving on to the next thing I want to do is the same operation, but now to remove the material in this oval cavity in the middle. A bore is not going to work for this since it's not a perfect circle. So instead, I'll choose a 2D pocket. Again, the 6mm end mill is already pre-selected, numbers look good. In the geometry tab, I'll select the pocket as the bottom perimeter of what I want to cut. In the heights, I know we'll have the same problem as before, so I'll make sure the top height is set to stock top. In the passes tab, I'll leave stock to leave on for now, with just a small radial amount. And then in the linking tab, I'm not going to bother with anything right now, but I'll keep ramping on and set it to 1 degree, which is usually a good amount for any ramping in aluminum, and then click OK. So that toolpath looks good, but it also looks like it's stepping down a little too aggressively from my experience. I could adjust the ramping to something more shallow, or I could turn on multiple depths and then set the maximum step down to about 1mm, which I know is fine for this tool from experience. So checking the simulation again, this looks OK to me, and I think I'm also done with a 6mm tool entirely, and ready to do the finer details with a smaller tool. 
So my plan is to clean off all the remaining material with a 4mm end mill and then do finishing passes on all the features to get them down to final dimension. To switch tools, now I need to make an entirely new setup. Instead of starting a new setup all over again, I can right click the existing setup and then click duplicate. This makes an exact copy. So if I expand it, I can delete the existing operations and the real benefit to this is that the work coordinates and the stock are all set up identically. So if I plan to probe off of the same faces as before, then when I change the tool, the X and Y is still already probed in on the machine, and only the Z height needs to be reprobed. This is a time saving trick so that you can spend less time setting up tools and operations, and avoid any error by reprobing a surface that might not be entirely flat or clean or easy to probe. So anyways, now that I have a new blank setup ready, the first thing I want to do is remove all of the material around the circles and the star extrusion up on the top surface of the part. To do that, I'll use a 2D adaptive clearing, which is good for this sort of open top area machining. First thing I'm going to do is click the select tool, and then navigate to my 4mm end mill for aluminum. Because I've already set up my tool library before with the right speeds and feeds for this tool, all of the numbers here should already be ideal. On the geometry tab, I'm going to click on the top face that I want machined. In the heights tab, everything should be fine. And then in the passes tab, there are a few things I want to change. First, I'm going to reduce the optimal load to something lower that's more manageable for this tool. I'll pick 0.7mm for now, and then leave a small amount of stock to leave only on the radius. In the linking tab, I'll leave everything as default and then click OK for now. So in the simulation, this looks fine. It is giving me an error thinking that it's plunging into the stock, but that's only because it doesn't realize that this stock was already removed in the previous setup. To get a better idea of what's going on, I can highlight both setups, and then click simulate and it will recognize that there is not actually a collision. So again, that looks entirely fine, but from experience, I know that this toolpath is not very time efficient and is wasting a lot of time moving the machine around in the air and not cutting anything. What I can do to reduce this cutting time and be more efficient is go back to the passes tab and then click on both ways. Normally, we're only cutting and climb milling, which means the tool can only approach the material in a certain direction, but in this situation, it's faster to cut in both climb and conventional to speed things up. I can adjust the feed and optimal load for the conventional cuts here, so I'll set it to something a little lighter and then click OK. Now in the simulation, we can see that the end mill is doing a lot of back and forth efficient cutting, and it's not lifting the z-axis up repeatedly to reposition. So now that all that material is removed, I want to do the final finishing passes on the walls of everything to get them to final dimension. To do that, I'm going to make sure the current setup is highlighted, then click 2D Contour. My 4mm tool is pre-selected, so in the Geometry tab, I'll click on the perimeters of all the features I want to machine around. In the Heights tab, everything should be fine. In the Passes tab, I'm going to increase the tolerances here, and then click on Multiple Finish Passes. That gives me some new options, so I'll leave number of finish passes to 2, but I'll change the step over to something extremely tiny, like 0.001mm, and the finish feed rate I'll make much slower than normal, like 500mm per minute. I'm also going to add some finishing overlap, which is always a good idea, and make sure that the lead in and lead out is not on the same spot, which can sometimes leave a little mark. Everything else in linking should be good, so I'll click OK. In the simulation, we can see that the 4mm tool does everything as expected, adding that super tiny second finishing pass on everything. So I'm done with the 4mm end mill, and now I'm going to tackle this 3D engraved surface. The way I'm going to do this is by using a 4mm ball end mill, and do tons of tiny passes over the surface. To do this, I'll first make a duplicated setup again, then delete everything inside. Next, I'm going to highlight the setup and then click 3D Parallel. In this setup, I'll choose my 4mm ball end mill, and then in the Geometry tab, click on the machining boundary, then click the bottom perimeter of the area I want machined. There are a lot more settings here you can explore, but for now, I'll click OK and just see what happens. Obviously, this is not what I want for a smooth surface, so I'll go back in and then under Passes, change the step over to something very tiny, like 0.05mm. In 
Now this looks a lot more like what I want. If we look at this in the simulation however, I am not happy with how much material the ball end mill has to remove on the slope of the surface. A better solution here would be to remove some of that excess material from beforehand so that the ball end mill just has to lightly skim the surface which will likely give a better smoother result. So I'm fine with this ball end mill setup but I'm going to go back to the 4mm flat end mill and use it to remove some of this excess material. So I'll highlight the 4mm flat setup and then choose a 3D ramp operation. In the ramp I'll select the boundary for where I want machined and I'll leave everything as default. But I'll set a small 0.2mm step down and I'll turn on stock to leave and leave an axial stock of about 0.1mm just so that this end mill does not touch or ruin the final surface and that only the ball mill touches it. So I can see that that does not do what I want. The tool is going outside of the selected area. The solution here is under geometry and tool containment. This should be on tool center on boundary instead. Now clicking OK, that looks much better. So the last thing to do now on this part is the chamfers and 3D engraving. I have a 6mm chamfer tool so I'll use that for both tasks. So once again I'll duplicate the setup then delete everything inside. With the current setup selected, I'm going to click 2D chamfer to do the first set of 2D chamfers. First thing I'll do is navigate to my chamfer tool and select it. I'll then click on all the top edges of the 2D chamfers I want to do and then click OK. In the simulation this looks fine, but the chamfer width is way too thick and cutting into the part. The problem here is that I already have the chamfer modeled in CAD, so since I clicked the edge of the existing chamfer already, I actually want to take a zero thickness chamfer on those edges. Changing that and then clicking the simulation again, now I can see the chamfer tool is tracing the correct path. Now for the 3D chamfer, I'm actually going to use a trace instead of a chamfer. So in the trace, I'll leave everything default. Select the bottom edges of the 3D chamfer. And then in the passes tab, turn on the chamfer box and then set the values to zero like before. This accomplishes the 3D chamfer I want by tracing the tip of the tool along the bottom of the chamfer. The last thing to do now is the 3D text. I'm going to use the same trace operation as before and this time select all the text lines as the selection. I'm selecting the bottom edges of the text and this is because I want the tool to penetrate down into the material to make a decent engraving. I'll also uncheck chamfer this time. One important thing to do is make sure that the feed rate is something very slow since this is a delicate tool and can easily break the tip off if it's fed too fast and I also want it to come out looking very clean and smooth. So that's all the cam setup done for this entire part. In the next episode we'll go over to the DMC2 and actually set everything up. There is one last quick tip I want to share here which will speed up your cam setups in general. If you're doing a lot of machining in a particular material, for example aluminum, and using the same few end mills over and over, then ultimately you're doing these same simple facings, contours, adaptive, and pockets over and over using the exact same parameters and stepovers. There's no reason to manually input the same data over and over again on different parts every day. Instead, what I recommend you do is create a mock part with all of the common features you find yourself doing like I have here. In this part file, I've made a setup and made one of each toolpath that I commonly use in, for example, a 4mm end mill in aluminum. 
These toolpaths have the correct feeds, speeds, stepovers, ramps, and so on that I use with a 4mm tool in aluminum. Now what I can do is right click on an operation and click store as template and then name this operation for example 4mm flat facing in aluminum. Now when I open a new part and create a setup, instead of manually adding a toolpath and selecting a tool, I can right click the setup and then click create from template and then I have that save template as an option. If I click that, the face operation appears with all the right parameters set up and all I need to do is select the geometry that the operation needs to apply to. And that's it. I have the face operation ready to go in literally 5 seconds. Now to add even further to this trick, rather than saving each individual operation per tool per material as a template, I'm going to go back to my template part, highlight all of the 4mm flat end mill operations that I like to use in aluminum, and then save this entire thing as a template called 4mm flat in aluminum for example. Now if I go back to my new part, delete this, and now right click and choose that new 4mm everything template. Now everything I ever need for this tool is here and I can delete what I don't need and apply the ones I want. This is a massive time saving trick and also saves you from any errors from typing in the wrong decimal place or missing a zero every time you manually enter the numbers. As you machine more and more you can go back to that template part and update your feeds and speeds or parameters or anything and rewrite the save to update it. Another thing I like to do is save a template just for contouring parts out with tabs in my favorite 4mm end mill since this is something I do all the time. This way the right tab thickness is set with stock to leave and then a slow cleanup contour comes in afterwards that cuts just above the tabs to leave them in place. So I highly recommend you do the same once you dial in the cut recipes that you most commonly use. I'll also provide my templates in the tools that I use and sell on the Sheriff DMC website as well as my tool library so that if you buy these exact tools or anything even similar, you can pretty much have all the groundwork done and save you weeks worth of guessing and testing parameters and learning the hard way breaking tools. So that's all for this episode, hope you learned something new. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.